Hello, everyone. I'm Carrie Otterburn of the Lubin Center for Global Governance Studies, and I am delighted to welcome you all to this high-level lecture brought to you as a final event of the GLOBE Project. The GLOBE Project recently concluded four years of research on the European Union and global governance, focusing on the strategic areas of trade and development, security, migration, finance, and investment. Today, we are joined by Dr. Javier Solana, who will speak to us today on the topic, geopolitics and global governance in times of crisis. Though he hardly needs an introduction, Dr. Solana is currently the president of Asade Geo Center for Global Economy and Geopolitics. In addition, he is chairman of the Royal Board of Trustees of the Prada Museum, as well as chairman of the Scientific Committee of the Laikaika Foundation. He is also a distinguished fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution and the president of the Aspen Institute, Spain. He is also a member of the board of directors of the European Council on Foreign Relations in London and Berlin, the International Advisory Council on the Council of Foreign Relations of New York, and the Munich Security Conference. He was Secretary General of NATO from 1995 to 1999 and High Representative for the Common Foreign and Security Policy of the European Union from 1999 to 2009. Previously, he held several ministerial positions in the Spanish government, including Minister of Foreign Affairs. I'm also pleased to introduce our distinguished moderator, Professor Dr. Angel Saz Carranza, Director of Asade Geo Center for Global Economy and Geopolitics, as well as Associate Professor of the Department of Strategy and General Management, and Visiting Professor at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. I would like to invite the audience to send questions at any time throughout the lecture. Uh, by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the webinar window, you'll see a little button down there that says Q&A. Feel free to use that at any point to send your questions to us uh, throughout the webinar. And we will collect these questions and there will be time for a Q&A session following the lecture. On behalf of the GLOBE Project, I would like to warmly thank Dr. Solana and Professor Sasparanza for joining us today. And I now will turn the floor over to you, Professor. Hello, uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, as one of the final events we at uh, within the GLOBE Project, which uh, we have had the pleasure to um, to execute together with, among others, University of Leuven, uh, with Kerry, and also um, eBay, led by eBay here in, in Barcelona. So I'm based in Barcelona right now. Uh, Professor Solana is in Madrid, and Kerry, you're in Brussels. So this is a nice European triangle. So without uh, further uh, delay, let's jump in and, and, and have the conversation with uh, Professor Solana. Um, so we have quite an interesting and both for good and for bad a moment for global governance and geopolitics perhaps we can start off by knowing what professor solana thinks about the state of global governance so how are we doing in governing the globe and what is the state of the world right now professor well first of all let me let me thank you very much uh, for the invitation and let me congratulate you because the work that you have done on the project, the blog project, is uh, is very very good. Uh, I have been accompanying you sometimes, uh, and I have enjoyed very much uh, seeing your work. But uh, going to to your question, uh, oh, I think you you cannot expect uh, from a world which is fragmented. When you see economies which are decoupling from each other, uh, you cannot uh, imagine that the global governance is in a, in a good state. So we are really uh, suffering a lot. Uh, the global governance is suffering a lot of the reality in which we are living. We are in the midst of a, of a war, a war that we don't know how is going to end, which is making dramatic uh, sufferings of people of the European Union, something we didn't expect that it would be another physical war in, in, in our territory. Uh, therefore, uh, the situation of the global governance uh, cannot be uh, in good shape. The situation is bad. And uh, it's bad uh, not only because the United Nations is not working in, in the manner that I would have liked to see in working uh, having a secretary general, which is a European, uh, having the possibility of uh, acting in under a member of the Security Council of the United Nations is doing what he's doing. 
Um, this is uh, one element of governance or global governance, which uh, I miss very much uh, to be more active. But notice not only that, uh, you go into the WTO for instance, trade, on trade the situation is also very poor. Mm -hmm. uh, none of the activity that uh, the WTO used to have uh, is taking place. Um, uh, physical goods uh, are not moving in the manner that they used to be moving before. And um, so the, 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 the trade components of, of, of governance, which makes basic elements of globalization, is not uh, properly active. Now, not to say anything, uh, not to say anything about uh, global public health. It is true that uh, the pandemic has been traumatic, no doubt about that. It is true also the positive, uh, positive consequences that we have been able in a short period of time to, to get uh, vaccines, uh, a number of vaccines, which uh, have been uh, uh, in place in less than a year from the first uh, COVID infection. So this is a good thing. But at the end of the, at the, end of the moment, uh, the, the global south is not benefiting so much uh, of this effort that has been done as far as uh, vaccines is concerned. Now, if you look at China, it is today, uh, the situation as far as COVID is concerned is, is, a, is in a rather complicated uh, state. Uh, a vaccine that they, they, they yeah. used to work with, uh, it has not been the, the, the level of vaccine vaccination that uh, we have expected. And um, for the model that they, they, they try to, to, to put forward in order to fight uh, is the, the vaccine against the, the COVID has not uh, worked. And it's fascinating to see uh, a country of that big uh, country that's important that uh, days after he, he makes the most important speech in the most important uh, uh, the meeting, uh, probably in history for the for the Chinese, that uh, days after the policies have changed in a very radical manner. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's also a, a, a man. It's, it's, all, it's also something that we see not only uh, at the global governors, but uh, even the big countries are having enormous problems. To, to face the situation of today. So um, what is to be done? I think the most important thing will be to, to, re, to rethink, reconsider re how the, the war in, in, uh, between Ukraine and Russia can be settled. Settle is to be the word, but at least to diminish the, the, the suffering and um, try to from level, uh, diminishing the suffering, create a climate uh, which is propitious to, uh, to uh, some kind of uh, negotiation. Uh, I wouldn't say a final agreement, but at least something that will allow us not to have the level of suffering that is having, taking place now in Europe. Um, so mm, I am not a pessimistic. I don't like to be pessimistic. But it's very difficult to be optimistic. But I think we have to be optimistic because uh, it is impossible that uh, at the times in which we are living in the 21st century, in which we are able to do so many things technologically, et cetera, the fact that we are not able to handle the problem, the, problem, the global problems in a more intelligent far, uh, manner is really a contradiction. Uh, so, um... We are. We all want to be optimistic, of course, but the world has gone through quite a few crises in terms of of uh, coexistence and and global governance. Uh, we've had the trade war, later the pandemic, as you already were mentioning, the war in Ukraine and Europe again. Um, how do you view the different components of the world system, in particular the different and major countries in the world? How have they behaved in these latter years? Well, when, when, when you have a deficit of uh, governance or global governance, uh, that means uh, first that the big institutions 
we defined the global governors, and I mentioned three of them in the first uh, answer in the first question, but also the big powers. And the big powers are not in the best uh, state. When I mentioned uh, uh, a minute ago, the situation of China, for instance, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pandemic, vis-a-vis -vis the economy, the data that we have today, yesterday from the, from the uh, level of uh, number of births in, in, in China today, the diminishing in, in, in population, which is going to have enormous consequences uh, in, the, in the, not only in China, but in the world as a whole. Now, the big powers are not acting in the, in the, in the manner of, that uh, we had expected. Um, look at the, the, the China, the problem I have mentioned already, uh, the possibility of a conflict around Taiwan, which is still is there, uh, but look also for the United States. The United States is is is, is uh, it had gone through a very difficult times, uh, uh, the times of of, of Trump. Uh, Biden has uh, signified a certain uh, uh, optimistic uh, coup. But uh, when you look today to the situation, for instance, in the, in, the, in the Congress, the manner that the Congress president has been elected, the difficulties uh, for to do that is really very, very sad to see a country of such an importance, such an importance today, because uh, the big countries are very important when the problems are big. And, uh, but, uh, when they fail, when the problems are big because they have a crisis, an internal crisis, it's a drama. And then when, when we look at that, it is, it is very, very, very sad to see it. Uh, now, let me say a word about, uh, about the European Union. I, I, I think, uh, if you will allow me to say it, that the European Union is playing a very important role, and I think is doing things uh, in a manner that uh, much better than we have uh, that we have uh, had in, in, in other moments of crisis. I remember, two thousand and eight, for instance, the manner in which they got that crisis uh, was uh, was uh, solved or helped to be solved by the European Union was less important than the, what we are doing today. The European Union is playing an important role in itself, is trying to, to, to help uh, to find peace in Ukraine uh, in a very solid manner, in a very cooperative manner. And uh, I, I would dare to say that all the decisions that have been taken since the COVID until today, uh, the European Union has been taken in a manner that will lead to more integration in the European Union. Now that for me is a very important, very important thing that uh, even during a fantastic and dramatic crisis, pandemic, and then the war, all the decisions that we are taking is they're not, uh, none of them are going into less integration. Yeah, I think uh, that they are, most of them, all of them I would dare to say, in a direction for more integration. And that thing that is uh, the only good news as Europeans, we are all Europeans, is the only thing that uh, uh, I would like to underline about uh, this, uh, this uh, dramatic crisis in which we live. But I think that the European Union is, is, is acting in a manner which uh, 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 surprisingly much, way much better than any other crisis. And this moment, I think, is a, is a very important player, the European Union. See, we maintain this climate of, uh, of cooperation and integration more and more as the complications get bigger. So um, we'll get back to the EU, perhaps, later in, in the questions. Um, um, by the way, let me just remind the audience that we are more than happy to have uh, questions posed through the chat. So we look forward to those. So hopefully we can leave ample room for those of you that want to interact with us, in particular, Professor Solana, please mm -hmm. send in your questions. Um, let me um, 
um, touch upon a couple of perhaps bright moments in the latter months um, in these difficult times. Uh, one was the G20 meeting in Indonesia, where we saw some uh, defrosting between the US and China. Uh, and now, right now in the World Economic Forum in Davos, we hear that perhaps there might be some contacts between China and the United States. So perhaps you can comment on the importance mm -hmm. of this relationship and where do you think it might go and where in particular it should go? Well, they mentioned in the European, I mean, the, the United Nations and China. I think that uh, uh, I disagree with the position that the United States have uh, so dramatic vis-a-vis -vis changes in technology, for instance, uh, with, uh, with China. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's a mistake uh, to try to decouple or try to, to, to get the a, 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 a sector of the economy absolutely decoupled. Uh, I think that that is not a sustainable position. And at the end of the day, uh, it will be very difficult to, to, to maintain. If you want to have a, a second rate technological player in China, uh, you're not going to find it. They will go to continue even alone without any interconnection with the United States. Uh, they will catch up. Uh, uh, it will take more years. It will take uh, uh, some other uh, changes, but uh, they will not be a complete decoupling in the sense that the, the United States is going to be going at the speed of light and China is going at the speed of sound. That is not going to happen. And therefore, uh, this uh, manner of, of dealing as far as trade is concerned with this uh, uh, impossibility of uh, changing technology, I think it's a, it's a big mistake. It's much better to cooperate than to try to get the uh, decouple de in in this case in technology, but in many other things, politics also. So that is the, the first thing that I would like uh, I would like to underline. I think that uh, um, the big organizations in the United Nations, the other organizations of the system, they have to be with uh, the leaders that have uh, the will to, to, to move forward much, uh, much uh, faster. I don't see that. And um, I would like very much uh, to see the meetings. Uh, you have mentioned two meetings, the, the G20, uh, the latest G20, that uh, because they were there, the, the Xi Jinping and, and Biden, they had the opportunity to talk to each other. Now, it's true that uh, Xi Jinping had not uh, even leave uh, China for two years. Well, it has been an, an absent uh, leader in the international sphere, but uh, it is very important that they, they, they talk to each other and uh, something has been, uh, or they give the sentiment that are going a little bit better in some things which are easy to have to, to start with from the easy things and go into the more difficult. But in some of the easy things, I think that something has been can be uh, um, taken from from the meeting in in, in uh, the G20. Um, let's see what happens uh, out of Davos that starts today. Uh, to tell you the truth, I don't expect much uh, because uh, I don't think that the moment is a moment for uh, big meetings uh, in which. Uh, you try to give a, a declaration, a statement at the end, uh, try to pretend uh, to you are optimistic. I think it's much better the, the meetings of, of fewer people, but, but much more uh, devoted to, to, to really solving the, the big problems of the day. So I'm not, uh, I'm not going to, I don't expect anything revolutionary from, uh, from, uh, from Davos. Uh, um, but maybe a couple of meetings with, uh, of two or three people that are, that are attending. But uh, of the organization as such, I do not expect uh, really much. Great. So we start to uh, receive some of your questions, keep them coming. We'll get to them in a few minutes. Um, so Professor Solana, you, um, 
you've you, you've touched on a few institutions so far um, about in particular the lack of effectiveness of them. Which ones do you think the world needs the most right now? So if you were to if you could choose which institutions to make operational and effective again, which ones at the global level would you do you think are the most important that we need them back on track? Well, I, I think that uh, if we we intend to maintain the, an economy which is uh, global and we accept it as global and we want to be global, I think the WTO would be absolutely fundamental. Uh, the WTO should uh, take uh, uh, an important uh, uh, move in a faster manner. Of course, the WTO is built up of any other organization or countries. If those countries don't want to move, it's very difficult for the WTO to move. But uh, the leadership of WTO should try very much, very hard with tenacity to see if something can, really, can be can be begin to move in that uh, in the field of, of of trade. Many things that can be done, many things which are are possible to be done, and uh, I think that requires the catalyzer, and the catalyzer is the organization in in a way. That is one. The the other one, which is very important, is. Uh, the global public health. I mean, the, all the pandemia has shown is that uh, we have been able in the first world, let's put it that way, quotation marks, uh, able to, to get uh, vaccines uh, in, in 10 months, which is really a fantastic uh, achievement. But uh, we have uh, the global south, which uh, has not been able to to be benefited benefit by, by, by the vaccines. Really, the, the manner in which the distribution of this global good, which is a vaccine, has not been done. Um, so the first world is, is, is vaccinated, but the, the global south is, is unvaccinated or less vaccinated. So these this, uh, this, uh, signs that we do give the North are signs so so dramatic, so 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 sad. So uh, now that then we we when we go to the United Nations and have a vote on uh, something that for us is evident, uh, and uh, we do not understand how so many countries in the global south uh, they do not uh, accompany us. It's because they don't understand how we do things, how we take decisions. We don't. Uh, we, we don't have a, a, a position uh, that uh, is better understood by the rest. I mean, uh, the fact is, uh, the example is very clear. I just said it's uh, you know, the vaccines. This is very clear. The, the North is vaccinated and the global South is unvaccinated. And that is something that would be very difficult to get accepted by the by the by the by the south and our relation with the south with the global south unless we do change our position of the place it's going to be very very difficult very difficult to be maintained and then we will have uh, other countries maybe china that uh, would like to be the leader of the global south or pretends to be the leader of the global south creating but the uh, for us, uh, certain problems which are difficult to be really solved. So related to this, um, to, to the Global South that you were just mentioning, uh, somewhat related. So we've seen a few um, middle powers uh, becoming much more active and uh, non-aligned to a certain extent, to, neither with the US and with China. Um, names such as Turkey or countries such as Turkey come to mind, uh, Gulf states uh, and other countries in the global south as well. And what do you make of that? And what is, to your opinion, in your opinion, what would be the role these countries should and will play in the future? Well, I think that uh, as time goes by, if the crisis uh, does not destroy the, the, the future of these countries, I mean, on the moment that they, they have uh, today for better governments, etc., uh, I think they will play a more important, uh, more important role. But uh, let me let me let me take an example: in Latin America. 
Latin America is absent now, the voice of Latin America is absent, for instance, on climate change. If uh, a group of countries should be talking about climate change and should be helped to be done seriously on climate change, is Latin America, a lot of water, a lot of mountain, a lot of forest. Really, a, a, a group of countries really that could contribute to the, close, the, the climate change in a in a fantastic manner. But we don't see, we don't listen to a voice of Latin America. We don't help that voice to be created. So I think that. Uh, uh, this is a good example of middle-sized countries, middle-income countries, or lower, uh, not middle-income countries, a little bit lower than middle, but uh, it's, a, it's a group of countries that uh, for us Europeans uh, are fundamental, and I don't think we are uh, working with them, trying to deal with them uh, in a manner that uh, that uh, will be the, the, the best. And for the moment, is not the best. And for the moment, uh, the Latin American politics is getting more complicated. And uh, we are more absent from Latin America in the moment, which is um, producing uh, dramatic, well, dramatic changes in politics. Uh, I mean, what we have seen the other day with uh, President Lula, for instance, was is a, is a sign that the politics is not very healthy for the moment. And that, in several countries in Latin America are very important. That. And the consequences of that, and they are very absent on many important things on globalization. And in particular, on, on the elements of, of climate change, which uh, they should be playing a more important role. And for that, they need the help of, uh, of uh, some of the Nordic countries, in particular the European Union. Thank you. So let's move on to some of the questions that are coming in. So we, we have a few of them. Um, let's take a couple to look back at the EU, the European Union again. Uh, Ana Ballesteros asks whether the retreat of the United States of certain, of certain dimensions or certain regions in the world and the global governance, is that an opportunity for the EU to step in and step up? and take greater responsibility for global governance. And to a certain extent, related to that, Theodor Moga from Romania asks whether there is sufficient unity within the EU, in particular related to security issues, and there's sufficient capacities in the EU regarding defense and security to pick up that role and make the most of that opportunity and contribute to global governance. Okay, the two questions. The first, uh, I I will try to answer it in a in an optimistic manner. Uh, I don't think we need the United States to be less active for the European Union to be active. We are not. We don't want to be occupying uh, what others don't do. I think we have to do it together when both European Union, the United States, etc are the working collectively with the most, the most power and most speed. So it's to think that we are going to be better because the United States is less active is not, uh, is not a good starting point. So we should be active, all of us, in order to resolve these problems uh, and uh, not to wait uh, to act in the European Union when somebody else doesn't work. We have to work as much as possible and uh, together with everybody, in particular with our friends in the United States, and not waiting for the failure of them to, to, to occupy that space. That would be a very bad approach, I think. Um, now, the second thing that, uh, that, uh, that you ask, uh, is the European Union sufficiently uh, compact? sufficient uh, unity, integration, uh, to have a common response. On this, I will be very dramatic. The answer is yes. And I think the reality of today gives a yes as an answer. The European Union is acting at this point in time, and as we are talking, they are talking united, they are acting united, they are acting uh, according to the capacity that we have, and the capacity that countries alone or independently do have. 
the the solidarity with the with Ukraine is 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 is, is very important, and uh, and the solidarity in other issues with other countries or regions in the world is very solid also. So I think that at this point in time, uh, I would be uh, uh, a fan. If I were not a fan of the European Union, I would be a much more of a fan of the European Union. I think uh, we are we are showing our capacity, with some exceptions. Not all of the thing is perfect, but the average of the European Union today is uh, globally and uh, as European Union more more active and better working than it was ten years ago or twenty years ago. So I think we are in the right direction. I think we are in the right direction since unless something very dramatic occurred that I hope it will not happen, we are handling with difficulties, but with intelligence, the question of energy is being resolved. Uh, the, the fact that we don't have any, any energy from Russia, that it was uh, an important server of our uh, energy consumption. And um, so on that, uh, I would like to be optimistic. And I think that at this point in time, to be pessimistic is an stupidity. We have to be realistic and optimistic and try to move forward with the solidarity um, and with, uh, with the conviction that we have, uh, and we are showing in the new generations in the European Union, that uh, the European Union is an important actor, an important player. Is, is not the player, but it's one of the players which is more, more significant today in the in the world, uh, in the circumstances that we are living today. And we have a dramatic situation in our own territory. It's our, our solid territory, the one which is at war. Countries, our country which is, uh, is uh, European and uh, uh, which is the, 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 the subject of all the drama that is created by, by the Russian or President Putin. Mm. So, and that I am, uh, I, I want to be very emphatic on that. I, I, I think that the European Union uh, is given a, a response which uh, should be, uh, give us a sign of uh, potential capacities of the European Union. It's not a time to be pessimistic about the European Union, at least for me. At least for me. Good. Um, there's um, one I'm question sorry, coming I'm in. Sorry, I'm sorry, Angel. As far as capacities is concerned, you ask about capacities also. Of course, we don't have uh, all the capacities that we, that we should have, but not only on security matters, not only on defense, I mean, we don't have a relations on high technology. We are not uh, sufficiently developed. We don't have chips. Uh, we don't know how we are being to be ready for the quantum computing. All these things related to technology, uh, we are not, uh, we have to do a, a much uh, deeper effort in, uh, in, in order to get uh, the technological new waves that are coming. We cannot lose them. We have to be on top of them. And for that, a uh, big effort has to be done um, and research and uh, research uh, and technology and science in general. And uh, that, that I think that is one of the most important lessons that we have to, say, to take out of this uh, crisis in which we are living. Technology, science, research is something that we have to keep as uh, some of our most important priorities. Thank you. One another question relates uh, to EU defense and security, in particular to the war right now in Ukraine, the Russian aggression of Ukraine. Um, one, the question is: Is the solution to fully isolate Russia, which is mm -hmm. geographically in Europe, and is uh, mm -hmm. by definition is going to be our neighbor? Uh, what is the medium to long term? plan uh, with Russia and what is your what's your opinion about that well I, as you know I've been uh, in charge uh, in my previous positions very much with the problems of Ukraine and Russia I know Russia fairly well I wouldn't say I know Putin but have met with Putin many times 
and uh, I, I have been in, in Ukraine many, many times. And um, I helped them to, to, to get out of several problems that they had historically in the, in the last past century. <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, the, the position that uh, President Putin has taken is really very difficult to be accepted by the Europeans. It's impossible to have, and it will take many years to recover a relationship uh, with Russia uh, normalized. It's going to take a long time to do it. I mean, the position has been so dramatically uh, implemented by, by, by Putin that it will be very difficult to recuperate and a, a relationship, with, as you have said, is a relationship with this. Always we have tried to, to maintain uh, open. But um, I mean, we have uh, gone so far in the dependence that we had from Russia that uh, this is the situation where we are with a crisis also on energy, which uh, fortunately is, is, is being resolved with less damage than what uh, could have been expected. But um, I, this is not the time to think about uh, what we're going to do with Russia or how it's going to be our relation with Russia uh, the next uh, decade. I mean, I think we have to think how Russia now behaves in a proper manner and this war is finished. So let's move back to the global or up to the global level again in terms of global governance. And we have uh, three interesting questions about global governance and how to order and coordinate the world. So one is from, uh, let me pose the three together, if, if I may, Professor, and you can then uh, comment on them. One is Daniel Schaubacher, who is comment, he's asking, what do you, uh, do you think the, the um, reform of the United Nations in order to overcome the post World War II sort of order that is embedded in the world, in the United Nations, in particular in the Security Council. Do you think that might occur anytime soon? A second question about global governance comes from Ethiopia. Uh, Baka Kebede de Bella asks. Uh, if you were to think about a utopian global governance, how would that look like? And uh, finally, Professor Marx, related to global governance and to global uh, institutions, uh, Professor Marx is one of the leaders of GLOBE, good friend of ours based in uh, Leuven University, uh, uh, UKL. Uh, um, he asks whether do you see uh, as a real possibility to advance in global governance uh, for it to occur through coalitions of the willing to start off to create smaller groups that might be able to move it forward? In particular, for example, the World Trade Organization, uh, whether perhaps a small group of willing countries might be able to move forward and whether that is, uh, that is a, a realistic alternative. Well, the, 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 the United Nations is not going to be reformed uh, at this, uh, the time that we are talking. Uh, we have a crisis with one of the most important countries of the United Nations, member of the Security Council. So you can imagine that uh, it would be very difficult to move a single IOTA in the United Nations with the veto of Russia, for instance, which is to be expected if we want to go in the direction that the crisis, like the one we are suffering today, would not be possible within the rules of the United Nations. So I don't expect much of that direction at the top. But uh, I think that it's possible to work from bottom up, not top down. Some, some important uh, institutions, institutions which are uh, national uh, or, or regional, uh, which have to be to give a step forward and, and, and be called. Uh, that is true for uh, 
politics, but it's also for the civil society, for companies, for uh, the financial world. So we have to use everything, to everybody, to every collection of people or the institution, which are ready, uh, they need uh, in, to move forward to recuperate values that are working, which are not working today. The values which uh, we predicate values, but we don't uh, we don't uh, do the, the the what the value is supposed to be done. No? Uh, I think that uh, that is possible to try to do it also using all the elements uh, of uh, collective attack action. And I think that uh, uh, it is important that countries, big, intermediate size, rich and less rich, to try to find questions or places or things uh, where they could uh, work together to make some uh, steps in the right direction. But we are not going to resolve uh, everything in one go. But I think the response that uh, we have had, for instance, in the European Union from the COVID, the solidarity that has been done, that has been found, all these things uh, are lessons to be taken of how for other type of issues could be, could be, could be done. So I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, not pessimistic uh, because out of this situation, I don't think it is going to be a worse uh, world. I think that we will move for a, uh, towards a better uh, understanding among the different countries. The risk, the very dramatic risk is if there is a big decoupling between, let's say, the uh, Western world and China, for instance. A big decoupling on everything, that would be a very negative step, and it would be a step in the wrong direction. That's what I'm worrying me when I mentioned the United States and the, the, the position they have uh, with technology with China. Uh, I think that uh, if that goes in the direction of decoupling, which I think will be the, the worst uh, of, the, of the, motion, the movement that can take uh, the international community in the future. But uh, I think uh, uh, answering to the the question of, of, of your uh, collaborator and, and, and uh, in the program in the uh, global, I think that uh, coalitions of the willings have been a, a very interesting uh, uh, um, scheme and has been used. Uh, I remember very well in the time that I was in office, we have coalition of the willing acting for instance in Africa uh, with military actions, uh, peacekeeping operations. And remember that the European Union in, in, in those days, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, about 20 operations of peacekeeping in the world. So really we were very active in that type of, uh, type of thing. Now, um, these were done many of them on the basis of coalition of the willings. Uh, so I think that uh, coalition of the willings should be tried. It's not the best, the best will be uh, agreements uh, of everybody, but uh, in case we don't, uh, we don't have the possibility, uh, I think uh, try as a second best the coalition of the willings and uh, construct from that coalition of the willings working forward well, as an example for others to join to the coalition of the willings, we are another country which is willing to, con to, to contribute. So I think that uh, we have to try everything, everything, and not to, to, to discard any, any, any type of approach because the needs are many and, uh, and the wills to be constructive, uh, we have to mobilize them. And, um, Again, I go back to uh, what I said before, uh, the, the European Union is, is, a, is a place or an institution that uh, we have to take out all the possibilities that it has and try to put in uh, effectively to work and uh, including coalitions of the willingness.
Perhaps uh, staying on, on this topic about coalition of the willings, but applied to the European Union. So in another project that you that we are involved in, and you are, in fact, the chairperson of the advisory board, uh, Engage, another Horizon 2020, we've talked a lot about EU foreign and security policy and about whether we should overcome unanimity in European Union foreign and security policy. So Maria Isabel Nieto Fernandez asks, uh, should we and can we find ways of overcoming the unanimity rule in Europe in order to be better and more effective in our foreign and security policy? Well, this is a, is a complicated question. And I think uh, I should not uh, answer it with a yes or no, because uh, I think that we have to try, uh, try everything. And uh, I would not, uh, I mean, whatever goes, how, as far as we can go, let's go. Uh, but there's not a stop because we cannot go all the way. Uh, do you understand what I say? No? Very clearly. But I don't want to, to be my words, uh, be used to, to do something A or B or B and A. I, I really would like to go as far as possible, but really with a certain strength of going far. And uh, I think that, uh, that the coalition of the willings is, is given a moment, uh, maybe that is the only solution, but uh, we have to try really with courage and with energy to see if it can be, it can be done to, with us all together. Now, I, I imagine that uh, we have problems uh, with uh, some countries that we know and we have not, not mentioned, but uh, which are not uh, in favor of, uh, of uh, unanimity and security. But um, I think that uh, a coalition of the willings, uh, which are always with a disposition to move, is, uh, is quite an asset, quite an asset. So uh, let's go back to the um, global level. A uh, couple of questions regarding trade again. So we are eminently in a moment where countries and blocs, China, US, EU, seem to be turning more protectionist or at least more interventionist. Um, uh, Laia Comerma asks about whether you think this uh, turn is here to stay and what is your opinion regarding it? And in particular, uh, regarding the EU, Patricia Garcia Duran asks about uh, your opinion regarding the different instruments that the EU is, is building in order to protect itself. Many of these instruments might be seen as protectionists like the anti-coercion instrument, and other types of uh, uh, of uh, of rules. Well, uh, the, you are you are talking about something very complicated at this point, because this is the moment in which we cannot uh, lose the sense of direction. Uh, the temptations are many at this point in time, but I think we have to be very very careful not to take the wrong the wrong the wrong line. Um, protectionism is, is not in the DNA of the European Union. Um, we are born not to be protectionists, uh, but to be first a common uh, single market, then a political actor, and, uh, and playing in a world in which uh, the objectives, in particular the objectives of the public goods, the global public goods uh, are very clear, and that we have to, to, to fight to defend those goods. So this is a part of our DNA, the defense of the global, the public global, the global public goods. And uh, for that, uh, uh, I, I would not like to see, for instance, protectionism uh, being developed in the European Union. It's a risk, it's a risk. And it's also a risk, uh, a certain dominance of the bigger countries, which has to be also be careful now, which in this in these moments in which money is needed in order to 
to be more uh, better competitor with uh, the United States or with China, that uh, has to be Europeanly done, not nationally done. I think of that we have to be very careful. The Commission should be very careful to have uh, uh, risks of that nature. This would be a real, very bad uh, uh, mistake to my mind. And we have some signs and some sectors, in particular high technology, in which uh, we may be, we need to be more united than the, than the, than the, we are at this point in time. It's true that not every country has the same capabilities, but uh, uh, the money uh, that the, the, which is spent should be spent Europeanly. I think that uh, the, the manner would be the, 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 the manner in which we should work with these things uh, is to do it at the European level, not at the national level. Um, and that is uh, something that has to be put into the minds of, of the leaders of the European Union at this time. Temptation will be many, and we have to, be, uh, to do the utmost that those temptations do not gain. Mm. I think so, it's clear what they say, no? Very clear. So let's move on uh, back again to the global stage. Uh, I hope uh, the audience doesn't mind us interacting, going up and down in the complexities of, of global governance from and looking at the world from the EU where we are based as of now. Uh, however, let's go back to Latin America. I'm building on what uh, you were mentioning before about the need of having more Latin America in global governance. Professor Luis Valentin Ferrada from the Universidad de Chile uh, asks us, uh, so if you were to choose a, um, a, a vision of Latin American countries involved in global governance issues, where, what would that look like? So which institutions would you like to, uh, in, around which institutions would you like to see more Latin American countries and which Latin American countries in particular? Okay, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, let me say, institutions, as far as the European Union is concerned, they are several. Uh, the use that is done of these institutions is not, uh, is not uh, 10 over 10, it's, 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 it's very little. But institutions is, uh, maybe we have to adapt the institutions. But I would do, and I would put all my energy first to get uh, Mercosur working. I think Mercosur is something that is very difficult for the Latin Americans uh, to finish, but, uh, but it has to be finished. And if Mercosur is done, then the relationship with the European Union will be very high. And that will give uh, to the to, to both the European Union and the Latin Americans a very important push. Now, this is something that is, but uh, Latin America has water. Uh, Latin America has forests. Latin America has so many things which are needed to the contribution for a better world and in, in, in the public goods which is, is, is a pity that uh, is not playing a more important role. Whatever we can do, Europeans, it should be done. We have a relationship with Latin America, which is uh, easier than with other parts of the world. It's not, uh, it's not places which are, um, where we have not uh, have a historical contact in the past, uh, uh, economic, uh, important economic relationship. So, um, what you we have to think and you latin americans have to think you are living in a point in which uh, a change a political change a social change is taking in latin america which may be deep may be deep now we don't we have to 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 be careful how you handle this movement uh, this position in the european in the latin america you have uh, changes in, in, in politics in several countries. You have uh, an important country like is Brazil, uh, an important change. All these things have to be used and used rapidly. You, you need uh, to, 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 to be speaking 
uh, to the world um, rapidly as Latin Americans, I think. And uh, to my mind, uh, trade is one thing. Mercosur is a, a fantastic element because, as I said, uh, it will be an immediately good relationship also with the European Union. You will do two things in one. Um, I, 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 I am very, very uh, committed to Latin American development uh, and uh, to play in a role that uh, it is, uh, it is uh, important. Uh, I don't want to complicate the issues, but uh, even uh, the, there will be a vacancy in the US and United Nations in a few few months, months, not few, no, it's not two, eh? but let's take the unit a month. And uh, I would love very much to see a, a person from Latin America at the top, and is it possible a lady? And uh, there are several ladies which are very important politically, very socially, uh, uh, educated, uh, very sophisticated, that I think will give a tremendous impetus to one of these uh, organizations, which is so, so important, the most important one. So with that, I, I, I want to give you the sentiment that, uh, that I have vis-a-vis -vis Latin America. For me, Latin America is a continent that has to go move up, uh, move up and in, in, uh, in, uh, Inequality, but also on the on the using the the rules of the game internationally to be more present in the international community. We need Latin America being a player. Thank you. And perhaps to finish off, um, Silvia Soncini asks: So, how can individual citizens contribute to uh, a more effective? a better functioning global governance. Uh, she says that voting, certain parties, signing petitions do not seem to be enough. So what is what can individuals do to improve and to uh, contribute to a better global governance? OK, uh, global is very big. So you have to analyze uh, globalist, globals into the smaller globals and, uh, and diminish that and start by, by, by the individual plus another individual, another individual that create an NGO or create something or create a political party or create a, a dimension of cooperation with others. Uh, the cooperation is, uh, uh, the principle of cooperation is proximity, the principle. Now, not necessarily that there has to be physical proximity. Today, we 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 are not talking in the same room, but then we are like being in the same room. No, but I think that everybody, if everybody in his life will uh, will live uh, thinking that uh, um, there are many like him, uh, that uh, many people that do need uh, what you need and many people that uh, deserve what you deserve and and try to get uh, to get uh, these uh, these people uh, together if not physically together mentally together i, I think that uh, the uh, to me the the the, the essential uh, uh, sense uh, it's the essential cooperation and solidarity is uh, is inequality um, Fight for inequality. Fight for equality. Um, be, be in your life uh, trying to create in your neighborhood, in your neighborhood, physical or political or whatever, um, equality, equality, equality. Uh, equality, to my mind, is the most important thing that we have to achieve now. The breaches in the in the in the international community as far as poverty and and richness is dramatic. Uh, so solidarity, solidarity, solidarity. Thank you, thank you. So uh, with this, I think we reach our 
end or the end of the webinar. Thank you very much, Professor Solana, for your realist, optimistic, and insightful uh, comments regarding global governance. We could hardly find a better uh, commentator and presenter on global governance. Uh, thank you, and over to you, Kari. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Saskaranza and Professor Solana for this extremely interesting and varied um, discussion. And thank you, Professor Solana, for sharing your expertise, your vast expertise and wisdom on such a range of topics. I think we've covered so many things in a really short period of time, and you're leaving us with a lot to mull over. Before we close, I want to make one final plug for the GLOBE project. Although the GLOBE project has just wrapped up, the results of this project are freely available on our website, which is globe-project.eu. And we have lots of papers and webinars and recordings there for you to peruse. And also, if you're new to the concept of global governance, or if you're looking to dive a bit deeper, on our website, you can also find information on our massive open online course, which just launched recently. And this will be running um, in chunks of about seven weeks on an ongoing basis. It's free to join and uh, very, it should be very interesting. On behalf of the GLOBE Project, thank you all in the audience for joining us today and coming in with your questions. And special thank you to our guests um, for being here with us today. Hope to see you all again soon in some context or another. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.